Thank you, Daniel. Um, hi, again, uh, I'm Mark Tupas. I'm originally from the University of the Philippines, and I'm an open source and um, open data enthusiast, uh, if you would say, uh, back home. But for now, I'm wearing my other hat as a PhD student from the university, uh, from TUV. Um, so basically, we're presenting this work that we did for this global flood mapping initiative that we have done for the past um, couple of years. So I'm doing this presentation on behalf of my colleagues from the microwave remote sensing group. So we're rebranding now to just the uh, remote sensing group. Uh, but these are their names. If you um, have maybe some questions later on, my email is there. Uh, my colleague Claudio is also here. Uh, if you have other questions regarding the software that he is the main architect and main developer. So he's here for uh, to support uh, for any other questions regarding that. So with that, I'm going to go through with uh, my presentation. So I have basically three objectives with my presentation. It's just to show this uh, harmonic parameters that we generated, to show the software that, the software, uh, that we used, and to show how we used our software to compute those uh, parameters. It's not moving. OK, so this is the outline of my presentation. I'm just going to give an overview where uh, these products were generated from which project they come from and why do we use harmonic parameters uh, I'm going to briefly discuss uh, the data cube that we uh, that we use and then I'll go to the software that we use and then the processing and some sample outputs and then some just conclusions and outlook for the software and the data sets that we have Okay, so basically this uh, parameters that we generated, this was generated as an in intermediate product under the GRC Copernicus EMS flood mapping uh, program. So this program aims to generate flood maps um, near real time. So every time a Sentinel-1 data comes in, it aims to check if there's a flood there and then generate the flood maps within uh, maybe eight hours or even less. So we would have a product uh, flood mapping product without the need to uh, have this activation model. So if you want to view the results uh, of the global product and the uh, global processing, it's on these um, uh, links over there. And if you would want to see the WMS uh, endpoint, it's also um, on the link there. So the, this are, these are just the general product specifications, which, uh, which is the main output of the product, which is the flood maps and uh, their accompanying uh, products, but it's uh, basically a 20 meter product um, that we do globally. So, uh, and we aim to have this uh, nice, um, like thematic accuracy of about 70 to 80%. If you need to know more about the, uh, the products in the program, maybe you can uh, check out the resources and the uh, papers about this. Uh, but essentially the mapping, flood mapping that we were doing, it's not just one algorithm. We're using an ensemble algorithm that is based out of independent um, algorithms from DLR, LIST, and uh, TUV. Unfortunately, I won't be able to give you the details how DLR and LIST's algorithm work, but if you do have questions about how the TUV algorithm works, I can uh, discuss it with you guys. But basically, there's a majority voting, not just of uh, the pixels being flooded or non-flooded, but they also take into account the uh, probability of it being flood, flooded and so on and so forth. Okay, but uh, the TV um, ma flood mapping algorithm is actually based on just the base inference between a flooded and a non-flooded uh, probability distribution. So we get our non-flooded probability distribution from a harmonic model that I'm going to discuss for the rest of the presentation. Uh, and then we compare it with just a uh, probability distribution of water in sent uh, based on Sentinel-1 backscatter, but that we sampled from different, uh, different scenes. So basically, if you see uh, this uh, graph here or this uh, plot here, you would see that the uh, backscatter for uh, time series of a particular pixel, it actually varies, and you would see that there are seasonal variations to it. And if you have this very big drop um, out of that uh, expected backscatter, you would assume that probably this is flood because we know that in SAR data, if it's a low, if it has low backscatter, it probably is flood. Okay, but we wanted to just not just get it uh, based on the decrease, but we use, uh, as I mentioned, uh, base inference. So basically what you see in that slice there is you see our mean or the expected backscatter at that particular day and the uh, uh, standard deviation of the harmonic model, which we use to generate the non-flooded uh, 
non-flooded probability distribution and you see here our uh, this is just the water uh, mean and then the standard deviation of water for that particular area and then basically you just compare the probability distribution so you would know which is water which is not water so if it's water it's probably flooded if it wasn't uh, flooded before so that's that's a basic thing but the cool thing about this algorithm that we're using is that we don't assume that the backscatter of water all throughout the year is just static. So we know that it changes every time. So uh, for temperate regions, you have the four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and fall. Um, and in some, some other areas, you also have other seasons where your backscatter would actually change. So probably the decrease in backscatter might not be because of flooding. It might be just because of seasonal variations and all that stuff. So basically, our model takes into account the seasonal variations of the backscatter and not just label floods because the, there was a decrease in backscatter. So that, that's the general premise. Um, so the model that we use to model this uh, seasonal variation is this. So it's just based on the harmonic model. So it's just uh, we compute the Fourier coefficients uh, based on this. So we don't have um, like uh, a general trend. Uh, we assume that it's a static. Um, seasonal uh, model, so uh, we generate the uh, M0 and uh, basically the cosine coefficients and the sine coefficients of the harmonic model. But as I've shown earlier, we also compute the standard deviation, so we would get the probability distribution that I also mentioned. And as well, we also get the number of, uh, I mean, the number of sample points at least when you compute this particular uh, model that we use for our workflow. Okay, but um, in general, this is how it works. So we have this SAR data cube, uh, which is in uh, EUDC and TUV. And from there, we are able to compute this um, basically seven coefficients and then uh, the other uh, parameters as well. And using these images, you will be able to compute any backscatter value at any day of the year. So basically, these are just samples from January, April. Uh, July and October, and you would see that there are seasonal variations on how the backscatter uh, changes. Okay, so how or why do we uh, want to show this product with you guys? Because we think that the harmonic uh, parameters can also be used for other uh, other purposes. For example, in some in some literature, it is also used for uh, maybe vegetation analysis, uh, seasonal changes in vegetation. They can also use this for change detection in uh, vegetation. Um, a colleague of ours also did this, used this uh, similar analysis to map different types of wetlands, whether it's seasonally flooded or uh, it's just partially pl flooded and all that stuff. So these are the things that you can do with this data aside from the flood mapping uh, that, we, that we're currently doing. Uh, but generating this product for the globe is not really, uh, it's not that easy. I mean, if you uh, guys are very much familiar with using Google Earth Engine. It's easy for you guys because you would just maybe click and use the code already there. But if you don't have that particular platform, or maybe you have your own data sets that you would want to analyze and stuff, it's not really that easy to do. So for us, since we have our own uh, Sentinel-1 data cube, we were uh, faced with, the, uh, with these challenges. So basically, the, the GFM products should be generated in near real time. So these parameters that I showed you, we should process this beforehand. So we would have this bulk processing of all the Sentinel-1 data scenes of the whole globe and have all of these parameters uh, generated beforehand. And another tricky part about SAR data is that it has this geometric effects. If you're familiar with SAR, you know that based on the incidence angle, it would have this change in backscatter, um, if backscatter um, results. So, uh, we had to take it take this into account, so we have to do some filtering based on the data cube that we have and just match uh, this data sets with what was coming in and uh, match it with the uh, orbits or basically the incidence angles that you have. Okay, so basically this is a very um, technically and logistically um, challenging uh, task that we didn't have um, like I mean, we do have the technology to do it because we do have this uh, software that I'm going to uh, present to you guys. But basically, we did a pixel-wise analysis of all of the pixels that we have in our data cube and generated this particular product for the rest of the globe. Um, just to give you a brief um, maybe snapshot of the data cube that we're using, uh, we have our own data cube that was pre-processed using this uh, process over here, but I don't think I do have time to uh, get 
uh, into detail, but I would just want to point out the main difference that we have compared to other uh, SAR data cubes that are out there is that our data cube is sampled in the Equi7 uh, resampling and tiling system that I would uh, show in a, um, in a little bit. And also we have uh, it in 20 meters, not in the native uh, 10 meter sampling. Okay, but this is just the overview of um, everything that I would want to impart with you guys is that we have this software stack which is uh, topped up by Yoda. It's, it has Equi7 Grid, GeoPathFinder, Veranda, and also have, we have Windali. We use the software to compute the harmonic uh, parameter, parameters all over the globe. And we do this not just doing it on operations, but we started out with our experiments with our own local machines. We have it on a, a test bed. Then eventually we ran it in a high performance computing environment to do all the computations uh, for, all, for all of the globe. So this is just the, uh, the data cube software stack that we're, um, that we're using and we're developing. Uh, so these are the GitHub um, links that you can see over there. So uh, and some um, little summary of what those uh, software are for. So basically on the top of it, we have Yoda, we have the Equi7 Grid uh, software, GeoPathFinder for looking up uh, spatial files and uh, folder-based naming um, and handling. We also have Veranda, which is similar to uh, you can think of it as uh, Rasterio in a, in a data cube setting. And then we also have Medali for tagging uh, metadata for all of our results and ingesting the uh, metadata from other. So um, just to briefly show you what these uh, softwares are all about. So we have the F Equi7 Grid software, which basically we use to uh, tile the whole globe. So we have seven um, specific subgrids for the rest of the globe. Uh, why do we have this particular tiling system? Uh, we thought, I mean, um, there's a paper um, on it, so you can look it up. But basically, we want to reduce the oversampling of pixels for every uh, oversampling for the pixels. So we don't want to waste the pixels that uh, the, the samples that you get for every pixels that you have. So we have this uh, projection at different tiling systems, at different um, you have this di uh, different tile sizes and all that stuff. But in a software sense, we have this software that allows you to do that. Uh, programmatically, um, so it's based on uh, Python as well. So GeoPathFinder now is a software that allows us to like search folders, search uh, file names, and basically in other maybe uh, data cube um, implementations, you would have this indexing thi indexing thing. But for us, we do it via folder systems, file naming, and basically GeoPathFinder. Uh, GeoPathFinder allows us to generate the file naming, look up the tree, go up and down the tree for us to be able to um, search and also um, maybe later on know where uh, path where we would write this uh, results that we have. But it's basically just uh, it's using uh, file system logic where we have uh, different grids and different tiles in different folders. So as I mentioned, Veranda is just our IO, um, IO software. So based on the data that you can read from the different GeoTIFFs, you can create to you can create it into a NumPy arrays or X arrays that, of course, you can um, um, analyze later on. And lastly, we have Medali, which basically just writes the metadata for all the things that you would need that are not part of the general metadata that you have for your processing. For example, for us, we have to put in the redundancy of the uh, harmonic parameters, and we also have to uh, put in some other um, metadata information that's not in the usual metadata uh, themes that you have, which is basically it gets the details from the processing and then it puts it into the uh, puts it into the uh, the files. And again, Yoda just stops it all off and put, puts it all together. And it basically allows you to do the filtering in the higher level data cube um, access. So I'm going to show some just a little bit of um, some samples of how Yoda and the whole stack, how it works. But basically, we start out with GeoPathFinder to just point and search where the files are. So in our case, we have this hierarchical tiling system where um, they're in particular folders. You just say, uh, point to where the root directory are. And it will search that, uh, search the, th those directory and get the tree and all those files within that particular um, particular folder structure. And once you have the files, um, you know where the files are. You can now instantiate your data cube. 
where we use, um, uh, again, you use Yoda, but first you would need to define at which grid system that you're using. So we define that it's in uh, this particular grid system. In this case, it's from the, uh, from the EU subgrid. And then there you would have your data cube object. And from there, you can do your usual data cube stuff or you can do your filtering, um, extracting data, and then maybe getting some time series uh, for individual pixels and all that stuff. It's very similar to all of the other maybe data cube um, uh, products that you have seen in um, other um, other presentations so far. Okay, so what's the benefits of what's the benefit of the, these um, software stack? It's basically FOSS. It's uh, platform independent. We only only just need files in the file system. You don't need a database. You don't need um, like GeoJSON to like an overhead stuff to index um, your files. You only have uh, the file systems and the file naming convention that we uh, that we define. Um, so basically, you just need the software dependencies and the files in your file system, and then you're good. You can uh, run data cube analysis. So in the harmonic parameter case, uh, we did our experiments in our local PCs, and then we have this uh, testing bed um, in the cloud where we can maybe test it on a larger area. But in the end, it's the same software uh, in the same system that we use that we use for your local PC up until the HPC system. So it makes uh, easier for the researchers like me to perform the analysis on a small scale up into uh, the global scale. Uh, so just a rundown of how we do the uh, global processing. So we do the high performance computing jobs per continent and then we, per continent it's subdivided into several tiles and each tile we have one node for uh, the HPC and then essentially we do the filtering for each of those particular um, tiles and then we perform our um, uh, least squares regression to compute our harmonic coefficients. And then in the end, of course, we have to put in all the meta metadata using uh, Medali. And of course, and each and everyone's, every step you see the software that we used uh, to generate these harmonic parameters. Uh, because I don't have enough time, I just want to show that these are the uh, software interfaces and how it works if you are interested in how to, um, how to use it. But essentially, these are just the, uh, you need your pathfinder to get the path for your GTIFs. And then that's basically what you need aside from um, EQ7 grid to define your uh, data cube. Um, just a quick um, maybe uh, sneak peek to the data set that we have. So these are just examples, example tiles that we have generated. For this particular example tile, it just shows that we capture uh, seasonal variation in water based on this coefficients that we uh, computed. And on the next one, we have, again, the parameters. And you would see, I don't see, I don't think if you can see it, but there's a backscatter change in the vegetation uh, in this particular area um, in UK. Okay, so basically, this is the coverage of the uh, parameters that we have generated. So it mainly covers most of the globe, maybe some areas in Greenland where we don't have uh, enough um, samples. Um, in some areas where we do have um, like low number of samples where the parameters are not too good. But in general, we covered most of, uh, most of the globe. So in conclusion, uh, we were able to generate uh, Sentinel-1 harmonic parameter data sets uh, using the software that we have, so based on Yoda and its um, other uh, softwares. So basically, we did this for a uh, data set. For now, we did it for 2019 to 2020, but it's practically possible to do it at a lo longer uh, scale. Um, but aside from maybe the thing that I would also want to announce now is that aside from our software being open, the harmonic parameters, we're also opening up to the public. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't make it in time for us to put it in the repository, but maybe in late September, you would be able to um, access the, uh, that data set. But it would be somewhere here um, in this repository. So there's about five terabytes of data for the harmonic uh, data set for uh, six continents, um, and it's in the tile orbit sets that I've uh, mentioned. Um, and basically, that's it. Uh, and these are my references. And um, I would want, just want to acknowledge our partners when we um, in the project. Um, so UDC and the Vienna Scientific Cluster, where we did this um, analysis, and all of our colleagues there. And for me personally, uh, you know, I would want to thank my scholarship for my PhD and also the travel grant from uh, the FOS4G uh, 
uh, Phosphor G um, organizing committee. Yeah, and that's it. And if you would.